fat free skim milk. Is that what uh, your wife buys for your kids? Um, and again, it's not the fat that's the problem. The idea that fat's a problem, as Dr. Dayspring said, is because of this nine grams per calorie. Yeah. So somehow There's you're going to something else in there. You're going to get more calories. What this milk has is lactose. Um, lac that's a carbohydrate, isn't that's it? A carbohydrate. Wow. Anything that ends with OSC <laughs> is a carbohydrate. Um, do I think milk is the cause of heart disease or obesity in America? I actually don't, but it does, you know, it's, you would want your children to put on fat to keep them warm, to keep them insulated when they're infants, but to remove the fat because you think that that's somehow going to uh, keep them leaner or improve their risk of heart disease and to leave the carbs is just to exacerbate the problem, to you make it worse, could, not you, better. You could paradoxically make the case that if you need a little milk in your coffee, heavy cream would actually be better because there would be no lactose in it. Right. It would be fatty acids, uh, which are not going to contribute to insulin resistance. Yeah. It's funny, we've come to believe this idea that fat makes you fat. It just seems yeah. naturally that the, the, you know, animal fats in particular, the, the, the thick solid fats are problematic and the body just doesn't work that way. The body makes fat, stores fat because of carbohydrates, not because of the fats that we eat. Well, here's there's the egg. egg. Do you eat eggs for breakfast? Yeah. One of my favorite lines about eggs was from a woman who studied eggs in the 70s, egg consumption. You know, it's the perfect food. You can make a whole chicken from this. <laughs> you don't need a single other ingredient. Um, again, for years, the egg has, was the epitome of a, you know, death. Um, God, in the 90s, I can't tell you how many egg whites I must have thrown out in the course of my life. I mean, 10,000 I mean, ten thousand egg yolks because they got saturated fat in them. They have cholesterol in them. If you actually do a randomized control trial, a clinical trial, an experiment, you take 100 overweight or obese men like the you know, kind we're trying to reach here, and you put 50 of them in one group and you say you can eat as much eggs, as much meat, as much cheese, as much butter as you want, just don't eat these carbohydrates. And the other 50, you say, look, you do exactly what the American Heart Association tells you to do. Keep your calories to 1,400 calories a day. Now you're living on, you know, uh, whole grains and bread and uh, the skinless chicken breasts and you treat butter and cream and eggs like the plague because they're going to kill you and then you run them out for a couple years what you find out is that the men who are told to eat the eggs and the meat and the cheese and the skin of the chicken breast and to cook with butter end up healthier even though they could eat as much of this stuff as they want. If they want, they could have six eggs a day with bacon or sausage. This is how I got into this business. When you do clinical trials that test this hypothesis, get the same result every time. You eat the eggs and the bacon and the sausage and the meat, the red meat you've got there, and you eat the chicken breasts and you cook with butter, and you don't eat the carbs, you end up with better heart disease risk factors, this whole insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome is another word for it, goes away and you lose weight. And that doesn't happen to the people who eat the American Heart Association diet. That's why we're here. If those trials hadn't been done, I wouldn't be here. You might be telling your story, but you wouldn't be able to connect it. Oh, that with, is for sure. And yeah. that is why I wrote that kind review of Gary's book, because I've known a lot of the lipoprotein stuff for years, but nobody has ever put nutrition and lipoproteins in this whole metabolic mess together scientifically as Gary has, and, uh, and I owe him great credit yeah. for that. By the way, this would be at the top of the food pyramid as to every nutritionist is telling everyone never more than 300 milligrams of cholesterol per day. Where, where would be the evidence that backs up that statement? I don't think there is any. And let me throw a little human physiology into here. Hey, it's cholesterol in our arteries. I guess if we're eating, it's going from our mouth right into the arteries. Utter nonsense. And here's why. 
cholesterol that you eat goes down and it enters your intestine and it is subject to absorption. But if I would go down into any of our intestines in that little submarine, you know, that wasn't there a movie one time where a guy could drive Fantastic around the body? Fantastic voyage. Yes. Yeah. So if I went down into your jejunum after a meal and you ate a couple of eggs with your meal, I'd see a lot of cholesterol meandering in your jejunum there. But I'm going to go up to every cholesterol molecule and say, sir, where did you originate from? And maybe 15, maximum 20% would say, I came in through this person's mouth. Eight out of 10 of the molecules there would say, oh, I came through the liver, through the bile. I sat in the gallbladder for a few hours. And when this guy started eating, the gallbladder contracted. And that's how I got here. So what I'm trying to say is that about 85% of the cholesterol you and I are going to absorb after a meal was endogenously produced in your cells. A little dump truck called the lipoprotein, might have been an LDL, might have been an HDL, brought it back to your liver. Your liver had no use for it beyond doing certain things. Your liver put it into the bile and it went down because the liver is saying, hey, intestine, let's excrete this with the next bowel moment. We have no use for this excess cholesterol. But your darn intestine doesn't cooperate. The average human is going to absorb 50% of the cholesterol that presents to the gut. And most of it is of endogenous and biliary origin, not what you ate. Also, the only cholesterol that can be absorbed is what's called free cholesterol. Much of the cholesterol you eat is a sterified cholesterol. It's got a fatty acid attached to it. If a lipase in your body doesn't separate the fatty acid from cholesterol, that's a non-absorbable molecule that you just ate. So there's a process that ingested cholesterol has to go through before it can ever be absorbed. Any cholesterol coming out of your bile duct is free cholesterol, ready for absorption. So it's a nonsensical theory, and so many Americans are being told, oh my God, if you do, just stop eating eggs and your heart disease will go away, and it's, it's utter nonsense. It's an interesting history to this, too, because in the 1960s, I would, it's been clear that we, we regulate cholesterol independently of how much we eat. That's been known since the 1930s. Um, in the 1960s, there were two researchers who were obsessed with cholesterol, and they thought cholesterol in the diet, cholesterol in the bloodstream. Everyone else knew it was nonsense. But when the American Heart Association decided they were going to go after dietary fat, they wanted to present an effect. It wanted to present a unified front. And it was also decided that it was just too complicated to tell people that cholesterol in the diet is harmless cholesterol in the blood is the problem. So it was a kind of compromise. Say, look, we'll go after cholesterol too because that egg has saturated fat in it. What do we got to lose? We'll tell people not to eat cholesterol. And that way, we'll you know, present a unified front. We'll keep the message simple. We know the American public can't accept much. And people, once again, they start to believe the simple message at the price of reality. And the reality is this egg is maybe one of the healthiest foods you could eat. It's certainly not going to give you heart disease. Mm. These are two lamb chops. Uh, and you're in northern Nevada. We have a uh, huge uh, Basque population here. Uh, the way you cook these lamb chops is you cut up garlic. You put garlic in there by the bone. You put garlic salt on these lamb chops. Put the bone side down and barbecue them. Fabulous. The Basque bone people, side? the Basque people, really know how to cook lamb chops. How long do you keep them on the grill? In, until they look right. <laughs> it's a huge margin of error if you got <laughs> the bone side down. And they're, they're just wonderful. I'm an expert. I'll be happy to cook. Bone if you side think these down. Are, yeah, bone side down. That's how you cook. That's the Basque method of cooking. And give me a rough guess. Oh, 20 minutes. 25 20. minutes. Something like that. Well, the Do lipidologist is looking at, oh my God, is that saturated fat in your hands? Yeah. And I know people who spend hours in a supermarket reading every label, and they will not buy it if it says saturated fat on there. But I got some bad news for them. If they really could eat zero saturated fat in their diet, whatever they are eating, their biochemical machine called the human body is going to change a lot of it into saturated fat. Because, you know, every cell membrane in your body has a phospholipid border. A phospholipid is a phosphorus moiety with two fatty acids attached to it. 
And if you are a very healthy specimen, 50% of those fatty acids have to be saturated fat. It, first of all, it doesn't melt at room temperature. You're not an oil blob. It's rigid. It gives your cell membrane some rigidity. Now, the other, saturated, uh, the other fatty acid should be a highly polyunsaturated fatty acid because of all the double bonds. It sort of flips around, is involved with signal transduction, cell signaling of the nucleus. So we need saturated fat to be perfectly healthy human beings. And again, the obsession is it's nine calories per gram. If you eat too many calories, you're going to be fat. And certain saturated fats raise cholesterol. And that's, we're right back to what we've been discussing all afternoon. I couldn't have said it better. Actually, your <laughs> liver turns the carbohydrates you eat into uh, saturated well, fat. As I said, but and there are people on a mission. I will yeah. not eat a saturated fat. Yeah. And uh, whatever they are going to eat instead, you'll get saturated fats. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So and actually, you could show from clinical trials, and it has been shown by a group at the University of Connecticut, that the higher carb diets, you will have more saturated fats in your blood than you will from diets in which you eat a lot of saturated fats. Um, and if I can jump in, then your phospholipids are going to have two saturated fats in them. There will be no omega-6s or omega-3s. Right. And I believe that is a, probably a likely reason we have so many degenerative diseases, not only of the heart, but of the brain and the joints and the intestine and everything else. We need some of those other type of fatty acids, which uh, if you're reading carbs, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have saturated fat there. Do you want to follow up on that? I'm just gonna say again to give another metaphor. But remember, before I said it's not what you eat; it's you. Yes. You're not what you eat. You should eat what you are. Another way to put that is you're not what you eat. You're what your body does with what you eat. That is such and a the, key point. Yeah, and the message is what your body does with carbohydrates is it can deal with them and havoc. Uh, ensues what it does with these foods that are you know fat and protein is process them correctly and your body works correctly and again all of this it said we're not pulling this out of thin air like I said as a journalist I got into this because Clinical trial after clinical trial, experiment after experiment after experiment showed that people who eat the lamb chops, the eggs, are healthier than people who eat, you know, the potatoes, the bread, the dried cereals, the skim milk. Um, all you have to do is do an experiment. Science is about doing an experiment to test hypotheses. When you do those experiments, people end up healthier. And the problem is we've been preaching the opposite for so long that the government bureaucracies involved like the USDA and the National Cholesterol Education Program and the American Heart Association. These people have been pushing carb-rich diets, the base of the food guide pyramid on us for so long that I don't think they're venal, I don't think they're, they're, they're um, dishonest, they just can't accept another story even when that other story is supported almost completely by the science of the 21st century. They're pushing 1960s, 1970s era misconceptions when there have been 40 years of science that says, including diet experiment after diet experiments, that says we're eating the wrong things. You know, there's a, and, and you can tell the story better than I, but it's stuck in my brain since I read you, your books. And I'm going to mispronounce the island. Is it Tolakeo or something? It's an island off of New Zealand. Oh, Tokelau. Well, for, for, well, I don't know if that's the correct, correct way to say it now, yeah. then, you know, because I just saw it written. I never heard anyone for say it. For eons, these people just ate coconuts and fish. It was like a 90% <laughs> saturated fat and pigs, diet. And pigs. And uh, uh, then all of a sudden, you know, people from New Zealand or where it started, uh, we're going to bring some of you, you're getting overpopulated here, half of you come to the main island, and we're going to supply the rest of you with modern food here. And all they did was introduce all the modern diseases uh, yeah, as so they stopped eating all their saturated fat. Exactly. Yeah, I think they're, they're, their diets were something like 50% saturated fat because of the coconuts, the fish, pigs, the pork, and yeah, then you start eating modern diets. You add in basically white sugar and white flour, and you start seeing obesity, diabetes, heart disease. And this is a pattern, if you look in the history, that's 
uh, observable every it was particularly well documented on Tokelau or however you pronounce it <laughs> um, T O K E L A U um, but you could see it and I documented this in my books throughout history you had these populations that simply didn't have obesity diabetes heart disease cancer they were effectively non-existent. And then they start trading with the West and getting sugar and white flour. And all these diseases appear. One did, you know, the obesity comes first, then the heart disease, and eventually you have this whole cluster of diseases. And nowadays we see them in patients. When we talk about obesity being associated with a higher risk of heart disease, a higher risk of diabetes, a higher risk of cancer, what we mean is that once you start getting obese, you're at a higher risk of having all these diseases. So you could see it in populations. You could see it in individuals. If you look at it historically, you could see that the difference is they start eating Western diets. It's not that they become gluttons. It's not that they become sedentary. It's that they add sugar and white flour in particular to their diets. Whatever their baseline diet was, they could be agrarian populations that were living off, you know, that were farming. They could be um, exclusively meat eaters like the the Inuit or the Maasai who lived on you know the blood and milk and meat of the cattle they herded once you add the sugar and flour you see what are called diseases of civilization or diseases of Western diets and um, you know it's a very consistent compelling story that then like I said is confirmed in these experimental trials you get rid of those foods and this metabolic disorders you lose weight your insulin resistance goes away, your heart disease risk comes way down. You, in effect, get leaner and healthier.